to the second session of Mediterranean Talks. Uh, actually, I explained in the first one, but maybe uh, it's worth repeating the small story. Uh, this actually, uh, I'm giving a Burcu Kütüpçoğlu, by the way. Uh, I'm a member of the Faculty of Architecture at Istanbul Big University. And uh, I give a, a graduate course named uh, Mediterranean in Architectural and Urban Imagery. And uh, it's actually mostly about architecture, as uh, it sounds by its title. But we also have, uh, you know, discussions and lectures about the general uh, history, the general history of nature, and you know, nature and settlements of the Mediterranean. In this course, and so this spring semester, we decided to carry these discussions, these more general discussions on the natural and cultural history of the Mediterranean, to salt to uh, turn it into a more open and public event. Um, and we started Mediterranean Talks with uh, Jaira Maksumi last uh, month. And today we will be with Calliope Amitdaulu. Uh, but before presenting Calliope, I really want to thank uh, Sibel Bozdoğan, especially, for the huge support she gave me, both in planning the course and planning this lecture series. I'm really thankful, <laughs> and after Sibai was gone, I should thank the SALT team for their generous support, especially Merich and Dorans, uh, for working with me. And uh, as I said, tonight we are together with Kalioki Amit um, We will listen to our comparative study about the cities of Izmir and Thessaloniki. Sorry, I'm going to read this part. <laughs> Amigdala holds a PhD in architecture from the Bartlett School of Architecture, University College London. She's a lecturer at Izmir Tech Institute of Technology since January 2015. She received a diploma in architecture from the National Technical University of Athens in 2009 and a master's degree from, Lon from the London School of Economics in 2010. Uh, her doctoral studies were supported by Alexander Onassis Public Benefit Foundation and the Foundation for Education and European Culture. So, Kaliopi, thank you very much thank for you. being with us tonight. So, I will, always, I will also take my turn in, in thanking uh, people who made this possible, uh, Burcu Kütükçoğlu and uh, Sibel Hoca, Sibel Bozdan for her support, and um, I would really like to thank the SALT team for bringing me here. It's an honor to be here. So, um, I will start. In his teaching book, Cours d'Urbanism, which he used in his courses at the École des Travaux Publics in the 1930s and 40s, René Danger writes, Notice, nevertheless, that some cities, for example in the Orient, saw fires destroying entire neighborhoods, and that often provided an opportunity for excellent urbanist operations. Fortunately for French urbanism and unfortunately for its inhabitants, our region provided important examples to this statement. Both Izmir and Thessaloniki are included in the specific chapter. René Danger himself was directly involved in the reconstruction of Izmir, together with the Beaux-Arts architect um, Henri Prost, after the city was burned in 1922. Prost is, of course, uh, well known to an Istanbul audience because of his major work here, and maybe some of you remember the exhibition was, which was curated by Pierre Pinon and Jana Bilsel in 2010, and hosted by the Istanbul Research Institute. Prost's work in Izmir, as uh, shown here on the left, is comparatively less known. Thessaloniki, shown on the right, burnt down in the summer of 1917 and was redesigned by a committee headed by the Beaux-Arts architect Ernest Ebrar. Apart from these two cities, Ushak and Manisa also appear in the book, which brings together examples from all over the world in order to explain the evolution and the principles of urbanism through historical examples. Danger presents Henri Prost's work in Casablanca, Leon Joselis in Barcelona, Agassiz in Rio de Janeiro, Grebers in Philadelphia, and his own work in Algeria and Syria. It is not my intention today to analyze these two plans in detail, nor to go into the complex and exciting changes and interventions that took place during their implementation. 
Rather, I would like to stress the fact that the reason they were included in the book, uh, in a book called Kurd Urbanism, was precisely because they qualified in the eyes of its author as examples of modern French urbanism. And I say French because Danger is careful not to include any examples by non-French architects like Ankara. And moreover, he conceals the fact that in the case of Thessaloniki, the English Thomas Mawson and two Greek architects, Aristoteles Zachos and Konstantinos Kitsikis, were also part of the design committee. Hence, by urbanism, Danger in fact refers to a specific approach to city planning, which is also largely reflected in these two designs. Symmetry, zoning, diagonal routes and monumental squares, consideration for climate conditions and what is seen as a local culture, protection of specific historical monuments or areas, etc. Now, this exact situation uh, seen here, witnessed here, the visual print presence of the two cities outside the historical contexts of Greece and Turkey, of the nation states to which they belong, and inside the context of the French audience, which has its own priorities and anxieties, draws the framework through which I would like to talk about them today. I aim to take a closer look on how these architects perceived the region and their presence within it. What did the Near East mean to them? How did their activity in the area link to their own national or imperial identities? What is exactly the conceptual framework which allows Thessaloniki and Izmir to appear next to all these different cities and not, not next to others and to be taught in a course on urbanism in Paris? In order to hopefully answer some of these questions or to add new ones, I will follow the steps of Henri Prost and Ernest Ebrard as they moved back and forth in the Mediterranean. First, I will talk about the connections between French architects and how they formed networks in the, in the region. Then, I will take a closer look to their perceptions of the Orient, in quotes, and the legacy they saw in the projects for the, for the evolution of urbanism. A letter sent in July 1921 from Ebrard, who was there in Thessaloniki, who was in Thessaloniki at the time, to Prost, who was in Morocco, is a material evidence showing that the two architects knew each other's work and that they helped each other in the commission of new projects. I quote, I waited for the de definitive decision for the Indochina mission in order to write to you. Now that I have accepted, I proceed to announce it to you and to thank you for all that you have done for me. It's your opinion that was decisive to my selection. And further down, he says, so everything has been arranged for the best. And on September uh, 6th, I will take the boat for the Far East. As you know, it's about drawing a city in Dalat. According to what I've been told, you have created interesting things along these kinds of ideas in Rabat. I, I had the intention to come to see you in Morocco, but I, have, I still have a lot to do here and so on. So. Uh, and what happens is that what happened is that Henri Prost, in contact with the French governor in Indochina, Maurice Long, had proposed Ebrard, based in Thessaloniki at the time, for a six-month job to create an important station in Dalat. Ebrard accepted and moved to Hanoi in 1921, where he ended up spending ten years planning several towns in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. At the same time, however. Prost had also written to Leon Joseli, another Beaux-Arts architect, who had prepared the plan for Barcelona and later unsuccessfully tried to win the Ankara project. He explained to him that he did not propose him for the job as he knew how busy he was in Paris and asked him to find a replacement if Ebrard did not accept. So we see an, a network already forming in which the advertisement of a job did not only involve the communication to the possible candidate, but also informing other actors around about it. Prost himself could not take the job in Indochina because, as is well known, between 1913 and 1923, he was in Morocco, uh, in, in, Morocco. in collaboration with Marshal Lyotet, then governor of the French colony. He designed the cities of Rabat, Casablanca, Fez and others. After returning to France, he would work on the Western French Riviera. John Abbey Sell's research has shown that in 1923, when the Izmir municipality invited him to draw the new plan of the city, he could not fully commit uh, to the project due to lack of time 
and he invited René Danger uh, to collaborate with him, um, a person that he had worked before in Algeria and southern France. So more, more dots are added on the map here. But what were the foundations of a network? How was it formed? What lies behind, behind the words, my dear friend, mon vieux, that uh, Ebrard addresses to Prost? Two centers are, appear on the map, which made this network possible, Paris and Rome. We know that both Ebrard and Prost studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and, and both won the Grand Prix de Rome and moved to the Villa Medici, where the Académie de France in Rome is located. Prost won this prestigious award in 1902, and in Rome he found uh, no other than Tony Garnier working on the Cité Industrielle, Paul Bigot modeling a section of 4th century Rome, and Jean Hulot, who was working on the reconstruction of Selinante. If you notice, all of them were working on urban scale projects. During the following year, José Lee was added to the group and uh, started working on the city of Pompeii and shortly afterwards won the competition for the master plan of Barcelona and moved there. In 1904, Ebrard was the la latest addition to, the elite, to this elite group of architects and chose to study the palace complex of Diocletian in Sfalato, in today's Croatia, also following this new trend of picking urban scale projects. Hence, this group not only shared a strong identity originating from their common Bozar background, and the prestige of being a Villa Medici resident. As has been said, uh, among others, already in the 60s by Louis Hautecoeur, they pioneered a crucial shift from working on individual mon monuments to exploring the urban dimension. And I will, I will come back to this in a while. Hence, their experience in Rome defined to a large extent their approach to urbanism, as well the roots of their careers. In the case of Prost, Rome was very important for one more reason it gave him the job in Morocco. Why? Because while being a Medici resident, he had moved to Istanbul for two years, this is also well known, studying Hagia Sophia and its surroundings. And this apparently gave him an experience with, in quotes, a Muslim context. We get this feeling from Prost's recorded memories, where we see that in March 1912, he was told by the president of the Musée Social, Georges Rissler, in a casual encounter, Prost, you have to leave for Morocco. And this is not my formatting. This is the formatting of the recorded uh, text. I saw General Liotte. He is an extraordinary man. He wants to create new cities. You, a person who knows well the Muslim customs, you will be able to work there without hindrances. Go. So it seems that Istanbul is what uh, allows Prost to go to Morocco. And then, as research has shown, um, his experience in Morocco probably made him Atatürk's choice for Istanbul in the 1930s, and maybe even for Izmir in 1923. So Rome and Morocco appear as crucial stops in his itinerary from Paris to Turkey. Back in Paris, all these architects uh, were also among the founders of the Société Française des Urbanistes in 1913, adopting the neologism urbanisme, which first appeared in 1910, in order to specify their field. Moreover, together with others, they were involved in, in the Musée Social, which academics such as Ipek Akpenar, also from Istanbul, and Alexandra Yerolimpos from Thessaloniki, have described as a precursor of the Siam Congresses in the 1930s. It was a reformist establishment, which had been founded in France in 1895, and counted politicians, industrialists, employers, state officers, and technocrats amongst, it, among its members. One of the important products of this group of architects we are now getting more familiar with was Urbanisme, which was founded in 1932 and had no other than Henri Prost himself as president. As we see on the inner cover, the journal was founded under the patronage of French institutions as important as, important as the Musée Social and the Institute of History, Geography and Urban Economy of the city of Paris. The presence of figures uh, such as the governor of Morocco, Marshal Lyotte, are also telling of the weight this journal aimed to have. The names of Danger, Garnier, Greber all appear among the members. We can thus observe that Prost and Ebrard were neither unique exceptional cases, 
nor, on the other end, anonymous bearers of an urbanistic school. They belonged to a very specific pioneering group that emerged in early 20th century French urbanism and, le and left a lasting impact on it, an impact that would be later taken over by modernism. Prost, Ebrard, and even Jocely, who, are, um, if I'm not mistaken, got the second prize in the competition of Ankara, represented this group's activity in the Near Orient. René Danger, the author of the Kurd Urbanism, although not a graduate of the Bozar, or uh, not a, he was not a Villa Medici scholar either, he became affiliated with this group together with his office and worked with Prost as well as independently, for example, in Beirut. Hence, um, to conclude this first part, the various cities included in the Kurd Urbanism do not coexist side by side by chance, and they are not just a collection of good examples of urbanism that were brought together. They were an attempted canon of modern French urbanism, the products of a network of architects and politicians who belonged to the same urbanist stream. They were aware of each other's work and helped each other to get projects all over the world. When Ernest Ebrard passed away in 1933, the journal dedicated a whole issue to his work. Important historians as Pierre Lavedan and Louis Hautecoeur, who would later also write uh, on Prost after his death in the 50s, extensively pre presented Ebrard's project in Croatia, Greece and French Indochina. His work for the reconstruction of Thessaloniki was the longest uh, section in the journal and was accompanied by many drawings and plans, bringing the city once again to a Western audience. One of the drawings shows the design of the main facades which were enforced on the buildings facing the main boulevards on the city, of the city, and also on those surrounding important Byzantine monuments, like the Byzantine Church of St. Sophia, in order to regulate the new look of the city. And as we can see, the design of the city facades has references to Byzantine revival, which is unsurprising. Greek national historiography had, since the 19th century, incorporated Byzantium as an integral part of Greek identity. I won't go into this topic today, but the Byzantine heritage of the city became one of its signifiers of Greekness and acquired a prominent place in the new plan of the Saloniki. The most important Byzantine churches were surrounded by squares and diagonal boulevards, which can even be seen here on the right side. Uh, important churches and other monuments are in the intersection of um, boulevards. So to return to the facade, uh, we noticed that it includes long passages on the ground level. They're not very visible, but maybe you can see them there. Important historians of Thessaloniki's architectural history, like Vasilis Kolonas and Jerolimpos and Hastaoulou, have given various interpretations to these passages. One of them is the reference to the church architecture of the city, for example, to the colonnades defining the tripartite separation of, each, of the church. And here you can see the colonnade on the right side of St. Demetrius, which was severely damaged from the fire. Hence, uh, adding another Byzantine reference to the city form, Alternatively, these passages have also been seen as a reference to Rome or as a manifestation of the architect's influence from their work in the colonies, where this typology was very popular. What is um, more interested, interesting and is, it hasn't been commented on a lot until now is that in Prost's uh, draft plan for Izmir, we can see here, there are some sketches on the upper right corner um, which you can see zoomed in on the right side, um, implying similar layouts, which, however, were never uh, realized in the case of Izmir. Whichever might be the right interpretation of this decision by the design committee in the Saloniki, and they might all be simultaneously true, the author of the article, Lavedan, writes, some streets, like Venizelo Street and Alexander the Great Street, bordered by arcades with luxury shops, um, had a restricted width. The pedestrians should be able to stroll, flaner in the text, and m move easily from one pavement to the other. Do not forget, he says, that in the Orient, 
Even the least of purchases can be the object of very long discussions, and that time has little value. Now, the reason why this quote carries an extra layer of irony, of course, is that, as we know, if there is one claim that all the emerging, emerging nation states in the region repeated with passion and determination, while in fierce competition with each other, is that they were not the Orient. In contrast, the drive for modernization and westernization was the main reason why foreign experts were invited in the region to take up projects. So this example brings forward the question, how did the architects see the Orient? Did it mean the same thing to, to them to build in Thessaloniki, Rabat or Dalat or Paris, as it meant in Paris? I will not claim to give a conclusive answer to this question, which would demand much more sc scrutinous work but I hope to shed a bit more light to it. For a start, we know that in contrast to many of the colonial contexts, the Near Orient was defined as the place of origin of Western architecture. In the Beaux-Arts, these architects received an architectural education which considered its roots to be in the ancient Greco-Roman lands. And this was reflected both in the classical aesthetics of design projects as well as in history classes. Here we can see a smiling Ionian. <laughs> um, among the Henri Prost's notes, photographs and teaching material, we can find his student notebook for the course on aesthetics at the Beaux-Arts. Uh, the introduction in the notebook makes it clear that the origins of architecture should be searched for neither in China nor in India or Mexico. Rather, it's implied, they should be traced to the Middle and Near East. Of course, not the Byzantine or Islamic East, but the Greco-Roman one. The, the notebook featured what it defined as the main architectural styles in history and their characteristics, Egyptian, Greek, Byzantine, Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance Italy, Arab, and a couple of lines on Persian art. Of all these styles, both the Byzantine and the Arabic styles were presented as having a tendency towards extravagance. This classical orientation of the Beaux-Arts is further obvious in the nature of the Prix de Rome and the Villa Medici that we saw earlier. During their residence here, the Beaux-Arts graduates were expected to make detailed studies of ancient Greco-Roman antiquities. And here we see uh, Ebrard's work in split. However, and here is where things start getting more complicated, these architects did not just accept and continue this tradition we saw that they initiated an urban movement. To do that, they reversed their relationship to these antiquities. The Near Orient was not important anymore because of the Ionian or Doric column, but because of its rational planning. Talking of his friend Hulot's work on the ancient city of Selinunt, Prost said, The new city constructed at the end of the 5th century, with its straight roads and the regularly aligned houses, demonstrate to us the oldest known application of the principles of the geometrical administration applied in honor of Hippodamus of Melitus. So the Medici architects developed a different line of continuity to ancient Greece, finding there the roots of urbanism. But that is not enough. In one of his later talks in, um, on Greek architecture as a director of the École Spéciale d'Architecture, dated 20, uh, 25 January 1932, uh, Henri Prost takes this one step further and proceeds to a synthesis of the classical aspects of the French Beaux-Arts uh, Beaux school, his interest in urbanism and colonial practice. He said, this is a kind of a long quote, but it's worth it, I promise. Uh, Greek cities were developed like our old cities, randomly. However, around the 6th century BC, a great urbanist movement was created. There were urbanists at the time, the word might be new, but there were urbanists even great movements in favor of hygiene. There was in the fifth century, at the time of Pericles, a certain Hypodamus, who was born in Asia Minor. He was a remarkable man and left a reputation. At that exact moment, the theory became the theory of the straight line. No more torture streets, no more expanding in random. And here comes the most important part. There was a search to realize new beautiful lines, but in Greece itself, composed of old cities, they could not exercise these methods. In contrast, in the colonies, and in Asia, which was an immense Greek colony like Asia Minor, they made plans according to new concepts. 
So Henri Prost does not just consolidate the shift in focus we mentioned from the monument to the city scale, whereby Greece is not anymore the source of the classical orders, but of modern urbanism. He proceeds to make, in my view, a clear parallel between ancient colonies and modern colonies. Ancient Greek cities of mainland Greece, like those of mainland France, could not apply the newly developed achievements of urbanism. It was the colonies that provided that opportunity. Contemporary France, as a heir and continuator of the civilization, would disseminate it in its contemporary co colonies, and I add, to the Near East, which is inhabited by people who have lost their connection to antiquity. So, um, while the architects have a strong connection with the ancient Orient, they didn't feel the same way with the modern inhabitants of those lands, whether Greeks or others, which they thought that had, they had lost their connections with the glorious past. Although Greece and Turkey never became colonies, these ideological positions did go hand in hand with the quest of legitimacy of the French presence in the area. Stamatopoulos has demonstrated how, for example, the Greek irredentionist Megali Idea, which was ideologically involved, which ideologically involved the revalorization of Byzantium I mentioned earlier, was a reaction to French interventionism in the Ottoman Empire and to the aspiration of France to set foot on those lands. One of the examples he cites is historian, the historian and journalist Jean-Joseph Pujula, who in his pamphlet La France et la Russie à Constantinople, already in the mid-19th century, had advocated that the peoples of the Ottoman Empire can move towards the West only if the French nation and the Catholic Church instead of the Russian or Greek Orthodoxy not only mediate by, but install themselves in the East. Ebrard's, Ernest Ebrard's presence in Thessaloniki at the time of the fire exemplifies this statement. The reason Ebrard got the project was because he was conscripted into the archaeological service of the French troops that arrived in Thessaloniki in, the late, in, in late 1916 as part of the military archaeological service. Going back to the honorary issue of urbanism we saw later, later in Lavedan's words, the Army of the Orient, of which he was part, resuming the traditions of Bonaparte in Egypt in desiring that his passage is not just marked by military victory, but by scientific work, had constituted an archaeological service. Um, so, uh, while the, uh, of the French troops were installed in the area, the French and British troops, um, they carried out a lot of uh, infrastructural and technological works, which they saw as part of their political project, not just part of the army, the military project. After the fire, the general of the French army immediately approached the Greek government and asked them to involve its architects and engineers in the reconstruction. For the record, the Greek government made sure to hire both a Frenchman and an Englishman, so they invited also the English architect, landscape architect, Thomas Mawson, in order to keep uh, good terms with both its allies. To conclude, uh, taking all the above into consideration, we can perhaps argue that the architects carried complex rather than naive or simplifying perceptions of the Orient. They were shaped by a deep and real knowledge of the area through their visits and studies during their time in the Villa Medici, for example. Um, by the need to find historical foundations for the pioneering urbanist experimentations and by underlying cultural hegemonies of the period. We can see here the, the career journeys of uh, Henri Prost in the upper part and Ernest Ebrard below. Their stories are not strictly individual stories, neither can they be simply explained by colonial or national frameworks, such as France's political agendas. The best scale to look at them is probably the scale of the pioneering network of architects whose activity in the area was shaped both by its innovative ideas as well as by its encounters with powerful political and spatial actors and its intersection with competing national and imperial ideologies, both in the Orient and at home. In the end, these architects' ultimate loyalty seemed to lie with the development of their urbanist ideas. To come back to the two cities, they saw them as genuine opportunities to try out the new principles of urbanism. 
We know that techniques developed in Thessaloniki, for example, were later used in Indochina. Um, and Ebrar is very explicit about it in his publications uh, in, and talks in the conferences. And its pioneering legislative system, which made its reconstruction possible, was recommended for the slums in London. Um, during the reconstruction of Thessaloniki, there was a property owners association founded, uh, which, uh, to, which is, to whose name all the burnt area was expropriated and to whose name the reconstruction happened. Uh, after the reconstruction, they had the right to bid for houses. Uh, they, they, hold, uh, they held bids, they held um, documents in their hands with which they could bid for the, the new houses in the area. And they had priority uh, compared to outsiders. Um, and this kind of model was um, a solution that had also already been tried out in the colonies. And, and was developed further in Thessaloniki. And then Thomas Molson, for example, Thomas Molson, the English architect that was involved in uh, Thessaloniki, uh, wrote about it in the planning review in, in the town planning journal in, uh, in the UK, um, describing it as a pioneering legislation which should be used in London. Um, this is impo it's important to understand uh, that, to underline that, um, there was a continuity in the knowledge produced and developed in these contexts. Since even when we analyze the rich ways in which local art actors intervened, shaped and redefined these plans, we tend to think of these cities as recipients, as finishing points of a transaction. However, this is far from true. They were important nodes where ideas were developed and changed before applied elsewhere. Furthermore, their dissemination back in Paris, completing a circle, gave them both a didactic and a propagandistic mission. Didactic, obviously because they were taught in schools of urbanism and presented in conferences and debated. Propagandistic because their showcasing aimed to promote French urbanism both with, within and outside France. They were defining it, exemplifying it, canonizing it, while usually neglecting to voice the uh, local actors and the diverse and decisive ways to which those um, these actors co-authored the plans in the respective cities. In fact, this is not just a matter of French nationalism, it also had to do with an interior battle within the discipline, as this group felt threatened by the rising modernist movement. And it is, it is perhaps better to explain this for the last time through a quote, um, a quote of uh, Otker, who in the catalogue of the 1933 Exposition d'Architecture Française, in which Thessaloniki featured, he remarks that uh, the visitors will note that French architecture is as modern as many others, but they will observe, observe also that it retains its traditional qualities. And what does he mean by tradition here? He says, uh, tradition does not mean imitation or routine. And here, of course, he refers to the modernist, uh, to modern movement. Tradition is the ensemble of the qualities imposed by the spirit, the climate and the social habits of a country. Here, this tradition is constituted by classicism, and classicism, he says, is not the observation of stereotypical forms, Corinthian or, or Ionic capitals. It is the rational and harmonic employment of materials and forms. We know in France that certain forms imposed by certain materials cannot be different in Japan and in France, exactly like the jacket, which won the whole world, whether it is regretted or not. Certain architectural forms are widespread in both hemispheres. So we don't believe that the employment of this or that form can constitute a national architecture, he says. But we think that the way a form is designed, implemented, and implemented reveals the personality, the personality of the nation and the personality of the individual. Behind the form which is material, there is the spirit, and the spirit is manifested by the proportions which are rational and by certain qualities that can be sensed, end of quote. So here, Haute-Cure is describing a type of urbanism which is universal, but also distinctively French, in contrast to the Puritanism, as he calls it, of the international style. The idea of a universalist urbanism, which still carries the, in quote, personality of the nation, brings me back for one last time to the new face of Thessaloniki. With its classical, regional, but also national connotations, it allows for the projection of multiple intertangling definitions of the Orient and the West, each one valid for a different audience. It shows maybe in the eyes of the French, the Orient, which is now modern, 
or French, or in the eyes of um, the Greeks, the Orient, the West, which was one Greek, Greek, the West, which was once Greek, or the Greece, which was, is once again Western. The same flexibility of meaning holds true, of course, for the modernist movement which replaced it. But I believe that it is exactly this inevitable openness to interpretations and the multiplicity of perceptions which coexist in this picture which make these projects and encounters possible. Thank you for listening. application of a post-colonialist discourse uh, to a country or region where we don't uh, experience colonialism, uh, actually. And thinking about this colonialism, uh, or Selenik, or Izmir, or even Konstantinopol, which never experienced colonialism. Uh, and there is also this case of the issue of when we are thinking about this architectural issues, we are always thinking about this uh, theoretical part of it. Then, on the other hand, we also have engineers which we need to build and construct these buildings. Have you encountered any life stories about this, the application of uh, an imagination of an architect that you are uh, thinking or stu studying about? And they, throughout these construction processes, who, what kind of uh, engineers they, they, they were working with? Uh, in Salanik, in Izmir, and what was about their life stories? Uh, were they graduates of uh, in Istanbul, the Constantinople, or also they were graduates of uh, Paris engineering schools? When you ask for the um, life stories, uh, you mean the personal uh, diaries the of the accounts of these engineers that all these. Uh, People, uh, architects had to had to work with, and also there is also kind of theoretical question, methodological question about this applying the post-colonial discourse to a region where we didn't have a um, colonial experience. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to show that um, whether we want it or not, uh, there are the actors that are uh, present both in the colonial uh, context and in non-colonial context and in, me in the metropolis um, intersect. So um, I think uh, sometimes it's a bit uh, sterile to uh, draw borders and say that you know we can only think um, post-colonial theory in colonial contexts and um, we cannot benefit from it when thinking about different contexts. Of course, um, I never claimed and. I don't think that um, any contemporary scholar would easily claim that it's the same. But uh, some of the power, um, the hierarchies and the power struggles um, might resemble each other. And um, there, uh, there's also another layer of, um, another important layer. Uh, these architects use in non-colonial context tools that they have developed in colonial context. And maybe these tools acquired completely different meanings. Uh, so maybe in one context they serve French imperialism, but in the other context they are seen as a manifestation of a Western identity or the, uh, of a national identity, or they have a completely different meaning. And we have examples of this. Of course, this was not my topic today. But um, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, of course, it's not a, a you know, just a simple application of one theory on a, any place. We have to think of um, the local context every time. Um, in terms of personal stories, I mean, this would be fascinating. I don't have... Um, I, I ha we have more material about Andrei Prost, so we have more of his recorded memories, and I try to show some of them today. Unfortunately, Ebrar uh, doesn't... I mean, there's no Ebrar archive. 
There are very few documents about his life. Um, in terms of other engineers and other people that participated in this, in, this um, in terms of Thessaloniki, I haven't looked into it. To be honest, it's not my uh, research project. But in Izmir, there, is, um, there are interesting municipality albums and municipality minutes, which show how these projects were negotiated, were changed, um, were presented for the Turkish audience. And they, they were shown in postcards uh, so there's a whole world there, uh, which is really interesting and really rich. Again, of course, I, it, it wasn't my, my topic today. Uh, in terms of local expertise, um, in the case of Izmir, there is not um, foreign educated expertise uh, in the building, in the actual implementation of the plan. Uh, the builders are, are kind of trained together with the reconstruction of the city. For example, if you are if you are familiar with Kultur Park in Izmir, um, the builders uh, were selected while building the outside wall of the Kultur, of Kultur Park. So they were tested while uh, do, during the reconstruction and selected during the reconstruction. There are stories like that. You said in the beginning that um, these group of actors that uh, are around Middle Social and have traveled around the Mediterranean and the Middle East had an impact uh, later taken over by modernists. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> um, this group of actors, uh, Ebrar and Harry Frost, that are uh, connected to Middle Social. Uh, Kaliofi said that they had an impact later on modernism. Uh, but towards the end of the talk, you acknowledged that they, uh, modernism, international style modernism, was also uh, seen as a threat. Uh, it seems to me like, I don't know if you would agree, you know, 1933 is like a breaking point because at 1933, Athens Charter and the Corbusier takes over mm -hmm. the definition of urbanism. Yeah. You know, the Corbusier definition of urbanism, as we know, is very different from that because he's looking at uh, you know, new technologies and uh, whereas uh, their definition is looking at tradition and what we can bring from history. So um, how would you comment on this Le Corbusier factor as, 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 as a third actor there? Because the fact that, for example, in Turkey, Le Corbusier ended up not getting the commission, yes. but it was Prost your people who ended up planning Izmir and Istanbul. Uh, actually, to me, at least, says something about the political and ideological environment of the time. I mean, clearly, uh, these ideas were accepted and bought by other Turks and the Republic, and, uh, and, and there's a reason why uh, these were bought and not Le Corbusier's. You know, Le Corbusier's ideas did not sell until after Second so uh, you, I just wanted you to comment on, on, on that a little bit. Uh, and the reason I thought it was related to the previous question is because uh, it may be a non, Greece and Turkey may not be colonies, but uh, we have to remember that colonial did not necessarily have a very negative and bad connotation in those days, because colonial also meant civilizing mission. I mean, the French themselves saw it as civilizing mission, but some of the client countries also bought that idea of modernization and civilization and modernizing it uh, while making references to national heritage. So when, when Edrar, you know referred to Byzantine revival, that would be good, something good for Greek nationalism. Or when uh, Frost was in Istanbul, you know, he was trying to uh, look at Ottoman monuments, pre preserve them, etc. So uh, the context of the 30s or the interwar period in general is so nationalistic that I think 
the ideas that urbanism definition of your people suits that nationalistic environment much more than uh, Athens Charter or Lekotidia's notions of urbanism. Uh, so colonial in that sense is, is not considered to be, you know, in a political sense you're right, it is imperialism, whatever, but in a cultural sense, these colonial architects or planners were thinking in very much the same ways as nationalist politicians were thinking. Anyway, I, I sort of answered it, but I wanted to address that. I, uh, well, did you issue as well? <laughs> I agree with what you say. It has to do also with the specific historical and political context of those countries, which was more open to uh, um, historicist uh, facades. And um, uh, But also, I think it's a matter of uh, this preparation of the network, how strong the network was in the area and how early it was prepared. Um, so it took time to uh, replace it. it took, I mean, as far as I... Um, understand. Um, Le Corbusier was always late in, in this region. Um, in the case of Izmir, um, actually it's interesting because you said in the, um, the Prost and Danger plan uh, in 1940s rejected finally and the municipality of Izmir invites Le Corbusier to make a new plan. So it finally, his term, his term seems to uh, come. But um, because of the, and, and Le Corbusier actually proposes a very radical plan for Izmir according to his, his ideas of the Cité Verte. Uh, he ra raises Kemerauti and uh, replaces it with um, a lot of uh, green and uh, high-rise high buildings. But, um, and when he, um, because of the World, World War II, uh, his uh, proposal arrives in Izmir at a time where the political context has changed and these ideas are not welcome anymore. Uh, there's a second uh, historicist, there's a second of, um, current of historicism which has already kind of taken over maybe. So um, I think it's both. I think it's both that these ideas were more um, attractive maybe uh, and also it's the network was strong and the historical moments were strong. Ebrar was already there. Prost had already his connections. So it was difficult for that stream to take over before the Second World War, as you said. Actually, I have a question, Kairi. Um, as you said, both um, Prost and Ebrar, while ma making their plans for Kastanamuti and Izmir, they were actually dealing with uh, different kinds of you know, identities or different definitions of identities, like for example the French one, the Greek and Turkish ones, and also the Near East, for example. So there were some, um, you know, there, there was a variety. I was just wondering what the Mediterranean identity meant for them. Was it just classicism? You know, was it just what they, uh, you know, worked on at Villa Medici and during their Bozar uh, studies, or was there something more about uh, the Mediterranean identity that they, you know, um, how shall I say, implemented in their uh, works, in their plan? Not to my knowledge. I mean, I think that uh, to the extent of what I've seen, they are they don't take an interest in vernacular vernacular architecture. Or, like for them, the Mediterranean is the classical. And the ur their definition of the urbanism, uh, they trace the origins of urbanism there. But whereas Le Corbusier is much more rich in that sense. But um, I mean, I haven't been. I've been through the Prost archive. I haven't seen that kind of. They uh, they study both. Both of them study a lot of the mosques and the Islamic. What they see as an Islamic uh, architecture and art, but not the vernacular. Which is a shame. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like the course. <laughs> Any other questions? My question may be a little bit out of place, but I would like to ask that. Um, I always wonder this um, building called, what is it, uh, Karakri Palace, near here, but in our vicinity now, uh, designed by Giulio Mongeli, I think towards the end of the 19-teens. Uh, 
which is also in the New York Byzantine style, right? And it has those, all, all those explicit um, quotations from Hagia Sophia, like, just like the face uh, of these quotations from, from Saint Demetrius. I always wonder whether he had any contact whatever with Ebrar. Uh, Mongeri? Yes, do you uh, happen to mm. know any? It's a good question. <laughs> Not that I know of, but um, the, the, your question is very relevant in the sense that Byzantine revival is not one thing, and it, it, it's also a, a very interesting case where in different contexts it acquires different meanings. So um, for some uh, architects it's just another eclectic style which um, mm. according to the pattern they apply, but uh, um, there are Two currents. In, in the Greek context, Byzantine revival is connected to nation building. Uh, but in the European uh, context, early, 19th, early 20th century, your building mm. is a bit earlier than that, uh, it is a kind of a reaction to the classical styles. It, it becomes um, like the me medieval times start, suddenly take over, and uh, there is a lot of um, avant garde. But in pioneering movements based on Mauritian those. Mauritian things. So. Uh -huh, exactly. So um, I don't know about that, yeah. that building's history. But even in the context of Thessaloniki, um, we have Ebrar. Ebrar uh, studies Byzantine monuments. He goes by the, with the flow and he designs these facades, which also appeal to the um, Byzantine revival expectations of the authorities, but also um, uh, to his um, own. Um, background but, and expertise, but there is Aristoteles Zachos, who, uh, who is also part of the design committee and has a completely different approach to Byzantine mm. heritage. He's Yugen still, he, has, he comes from a different background. Um, and his building exists, he has work in Izmir as well. Um, so there are many Byzantine revivals, yeah. and it really and it's depends. Byzantine and Byzantine, early Byzantine, late Byzantine, yes, early Byzantine, more late antique, right? Whereas the other is more um, medieval, medieval, yeah. yeah. Ebrard's Byzantine revival has been criticized as superficial. Hmm. It's like just, it's more of the facade yeah. in, in that sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Bella Ocham, I don't know if you know anything more about that building, uh, but. Yeah. But he did design in many styles. He yeah. had no yeah. problem with. Yes. Any other questions? Well, I have a I have a question concerning uh, Izmir and uh, Thessaloniki in the context of, um, I guess we can see both projects as, in a way, revisionist projects, and as you said, ideologically loaded, right? So there's, in many ways, they're both, they're both post-liberation architectural and planning projects. And as you said, it's, it, they reflect nationalism and other identities that the, uh, you know, inhabitants would eventually ascribe to. My question is that in both cases, you, you're dealing with cities that, uh, apart from the new inhabitants, they also have a large number of uh, absent cities. Like, they have a past that is very much different to the one they're trying to portray through the new planning. And my question is whether in either Izmir or Thessaloniki, whether you, you get this in the architectural vocabulary. So are these people, are there any meaningful silences what I'm trying to say in, in terms of style that might be seen as references to the, to the past that was lost, or is the past sort of completely erased from the part of the architects as well and the planners as a sort of pre civilized or pre modern past that they have come to sort of remedy somehow? Is your question focusing on the uh, monumental heritage, the monuments, or is it about the inhabitants? And well, I didn't make that distinction in my head. <laughs> okay. Since I'm not an architect, but uh, could, you add, could you answer both? Of course. Um, in terms of the inhabitants, uh, what, there's a very important difference between the two cities, and very interesting difference. In Thessaloniki, the next day of the fire, the, the 
property owners are still there. The inhabitants are still there. Then they don't go with the fire. They go very quickly. Like we, the city burns in 1917. In 24, the Muslims go, and the 40s, the Jews go. Uh, but the, they are still there, and they boycott. They claim. They, of course, there is this property owners association, which is formed. Still, uh, their voice within the Greek nation state is much weaker than uh, what it would have been before. Um, and what happens in the case of Thessaloniki is that uh, the new city is now class uh, defined, defined according to class rather than according to ethnicity. So the whole uh, center is open to um, purchase, like the whole building, all the buildings are open to purchase by the upper or middle classes, and then the and they are mixed, they become mixed. So the Jewish majority finds itself uh, struggling to keep its uh, presence in the center, probably. Um, in terms of heritage in Thessaloniki, um, the Byzantine heritage is um, showcased, as I just mentioned in passing. In terms of Izmir, um, there is no interest, absolutely no interest in keeping any historical uh, monuments in the center, which was uh, mostly Christian, uh, Levantine, and Greek and Armenian. So the, the fire burns the Armenian and Greek, neighbor, and Greek neighborhood and the Levantines, the Levantines uh, neighborhood. Um, Prost actually, and it's a very good question, Prost tries to, one of the first things he does when he goes to Izmir is try to find which uh, historical buildings of value are um, still exist, survive, or are repairable. And he tries to keep one important street called French Street uh, to keep its uh, just its uh, trace on the on the urban layout. But these ideas are not uh, taken forward. They're, they're not uh, interesting for the authorities. Uh, so there is that I silence. I mean, the silence. There is no historic. There is no historicity. In in Selanik, you see a very a, a well constructed, a well narrated historical narrative. In Izmir, you see no narrative in that sense. What is interesting is that two buildings re survive in Izmir, a couple of buildings survive, but they are not visible. Like you see, it, it's not enough if they survive. They have to be uh, talked about or their old functions need to be um, remembered. And I read there has to be a kind of a performative memory there. For example, the Greek girls' school, which is now at the Turklisis and the uh, evangelical school, which is now Namikia Malisisi, only recently started coming forward as uh, former Greek schools. Like for until the 90s, nobody knew what was their previous function. So there is silence in two levels. There is <coughs> material absence, but also there is a um, kind of um, unvoicing of there is the building is there, but nobody talks about it. Starting from, from your last sentence, when you said the buildings are, thank you, the buildings are there, but nobody talks about them. Mm -hmm. Do you need to talk about the building, or is it need maybe the urban morphology that has to point out the value of the building? Both, I would say. Uh, I completely agree with you. I mean, um, what I mentioned about the Saloniki is that um, the urban layout of the city, maybe it's worth... Uh, here it's... Oh, I don't know nothing about... No, no, I just wanted to... Talking. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the Saloniki, selected Byzantine churches, which were in the Ottoman times uh, surrounded very tightly by houses, were completely cleansed. And there were, uh, there were big wide squares squares arranged around them in order to showcase them and highlight them. So I, I agree, completely agree that, of course, the urban layout is part of the narrative and it decides which monuments will come forward and which will be hidden. But um, also, um, I think that the talking about the buildings or remembering their function in, in some ways um, has to do with their, it also has to do with their new users and the way their histories are constructed, of course. Do we have any other questions? I guess not. So thank you very much, thank you very much. for your wonderful talk.